when we talk about sleep disorder breathing, one aspect that doesn't get addressed is the breathing component of it. And mouth breathing uh, is an endemic pretty much in children and adults. In the last five years, it's getting more and more research. And the statistics for mouth breathing in children ranges from about 25 to 50 percent. So, you know, we have a huge cohort of the population, both children and adults, who have breathing pattern disorders. I want to put the connection between how you breathe and the new traits in obstructive sleep apnea. Traditionally, obstructive sleep apnea was always seen as an anatomical issue. But now there's three new traits which are not non-anatomical. Arousal threshold, loop gain, and upper airway recruitment. And I want to tie that in with breathing. The two talks this morning was talking about obstructive sleep apnea is a multifactorial issue. It needs a multidisciplinary team. And if you only target your patients with one aspect or with one treatment plan, Many of your patients are not going to get the full treatment. In simple terms, when you breathe through the mouth, if you go out for a few drinks tonight and you go home, you go to bed, and alcohol, of course, is going to relax the muscles and make you breathe a little bit harder. You have your mouth open, you wake up in the morning, and you wake up and your throat is raw and inflamed. That's what the mouth breathing has done. Yes, alcohol has increased the intensity of it a little bit. But many people sleep in an open mouth. In actual fact, if you're over 40 years of age, you're six times more likely to sleep with your mouth open during sleep. You will never have your mouth open continuously during sleep, but you will tend to switch from mouth to nose to mouth to nose. So oral breathing alone rarely occurs. Dr. Christian Guimano said that if you have your mouth open up to 43% of the time, it's not an issue. It's when it happens from 44% of sleep time up to 100% of sleep time. It's an issue. Just as a matter of interest, many of you woke up with a dry mouth this morning. One person, one person's eyes. <laughs> if you woke up with a dry mouth this morning, you're, like, you're unlikely to have a deep sleep and you're unlikely to wake up alert. Mouth breathing is going to dry out the upper airways, but it also dries out the, upper, the lower airways. And your lower airways and your upper airways are linked. There's no such thing as a difference between the nose, the pharynx, the trachea going into the lungs, because whatever happens in the lungs will travel up to the nose, and whatever happens in the nose will travel down to the lungs. Your diaphragm, which is of course the main breathing muscle in the lower airways, is directly linked to the pharyngeal airway and dilatory muscles here. You need to get those working. How you breathe is going to have an influence on whether these muscles are keeping your airway open or not. During wakefulness, you're not having apnea as now, but something happens during sleep that the airways are collapsing. Increased stickiness of the upper airways. You have your mouth open, you dry out the upper airways, moisture is sucked out of the upper airways, and when your airways collapse, they stay collapsed for longer. So you have a more severe apnea, you stop breathing for a longer period of time, and then when you resume breathing, you will tend to resume breathing with hyperventilation, which will cause a destabilization of blood gases, which in turn will contribute to breast apnea. And we will look at that. Reduce lung volume. If you breathe through your mouth, what parts of your breathing muscles are you using? Look down at your chest. So I suggest that you look down at your chest and take a breath through your mouth. When you breathe through the mouth, what part of your respiratory muscles are you using? Which respiratory muscles dominate? You will use the accessory muscles. You will use your scalenes, you will use your sternocloid and mastoids, but you will not use your diaphragm as effectively. Diaphragmatic breathing is absolutely essential in helping to address sleep disorder breathing, and nose breathing is the key part of that. Your nose is directly linked to your diaphragm, your mouth is directly linked to the chest. Even though it's only in the last few years that this has been studied, one meta-analysis of 18 papers say that Few, if any, papers refute the fact that breathing through your mouth is not having some mechanical disadvantage in terms of breathing. I go back to the statistic that was presented on the incidence of mouth breathing in children. 
and 50% or anything ranging from 25% to 50%. One in two children persistently breathing through their mouth, having mouth breathing syndrome. We don't have a figure for adults. It has never been studied. Breathing doesn't get a whole lot of attention in terms of research, and that's what we're hoping to open up. If you breathe through your nose, the concentration of nasal, nit nasal nitric oxide is 50 to 200 parts per billion breathing through your nose. If you breathe through your mouth, it's 10. And nitric oxide is an aerocrine messenger. You need to get these upper airway muscles dil dilated. You need them to be working. Nitric oxide is a signaling molecule to send a message to the upper airway dilated muscles to stay open during sleep. If you breathe through your mouth, you bypass your nose and you don't, you don't harness nasal nitric oxide. Reduce messages to the upper airway dilated muscles by virtue of NO, nitric oxide, but also carbon dioxide. If you're breathing through your mouth, your mouth, your breathing will tend to be faster. You get rid of too much CO2 from the lungs, from the blood, and the loss of CO2, carbon dioxide is your primary stimulus to breathe. When you have normal breathing, or during your everyday regular breathing, what's driving your breathing is the gas carbon dioxide. Oxygen only drives your breathing when oxygen levels drop to about 50%. You have a huge reserve of oxygen in the body, but carbon dioxide is the primary stimulus to breathe. To give you an example, normal CO2 in the blood should be 40 millimeter of mercury pressure, and if there's an increase of CO2 in the blood, by between 2 and 5 millimetres of mercury pressure, ventilation doubles. Now, carbon dioxide plays a significant role in obstructive sleep apnea. We want to have normal breathing and we want to have normal CO2 because it's your alveolar CO2 which determines arterial CO2 and the CO2 in your lungs is influenced by how you breathe. Increased ventilator in response to carbon dioxide as a result of oral breathing, and I'll tie this in with loop day. Nasal breathing, the benefits of it. You've got a more moist upper and lower airways because you're not losing moisture. My breathing is causing trauma. Your nose performs up to 30 functions in the human body. Dr. Morris Cottle, an American ear, nose, and throat who founded the American Rhinological Society back in the 1970s. If you think about your nose, on a very hot day like today, you're going to put on suntan lotion if you're outside because you don't want the atmosphere, your skin is exposed to the atmosphere and you're trying to protect your skin from the atmosphere. If you were totally naked, your skin is two meters squared. The area of surface of exposure of your skin so the atmosphere is two meters squared. But every breath that you take into your body, you're taking it from the atmosphere. Atmospheric <coughs> air is directly in contact with your lungs. And the area of contact between the atmosphere and your lungs is 50 to 100 square meters. Your lungs are 50 times, up to 50 times more exposed to the atmosphere than your skin. You look after your skin, but we don't look after our lungs. Your nose is what nature has primarily designed to ensure a number of things. That air comes in at the proper regular, in terms of the breathing is regular. As you breathe through your nose, you pick up moisture, you pick up heat. You're taking this moist, warm air into your lungs and oxygen transfer will take place more readily. As you breathe through your nose, your nose is directly linked to your diaphragm. And as you breathe through your nose, you're carrying the air deeper into the lungs. The human lungs, you're sitting upright, the greatest concentration of blood in the human lungs is in the lower lobes of the lungs, not in the upper. If you're breathing through your mouth, you're taking the air into the upper part of the lungs. But the greatest concentration of blood is in the lower lobes. By breathing through your nose, you carry that oxygen deeper into the lungs, so a better gas exchange takes place. But also as you breathe through your nose, you pick up nitric oxide. You carry nitric oxide into your lungs, and nitric oxide redistributes the blood from the lower lobes of the lungs to the upper. 
Nays were breathing, according to Swift in 1988, with patients post jaw surgery when they had to have their jaws wired shut. Arterial oxygen uptake in the blood is between 10 and 15 percent higher with nose breathing than with mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is a stress to the human body. Prehistorically, throughout our evolution, we reverted to mouth breathing under extreme stress. Even during physical exercise, I flew in with Janaida yesterday, there was a film on one of the TVs on the airplane, and basically it looked at one of the first people to be ever uncovered here in the United States. This was a skeleton that was uncovered from a cave, submerged in water, 13,000 years ago. That individual had superb large nostrils, and that individual had super forward growth of the face. And the scientists were thinking, well, this person couldn't be related to the average Native American Indian because the facial structure is different. They checked it with DNA. The DNA was identical, but the facial structure had changed. So, the ancestors, the first indigenous people who come onto these islands, onto this continent, they had wonderful growth of the face. And that's not a whole lot long ago, that's 13,000 years ago. And looking at the Native American Indians who should really, you would think, have a more traditional lifestyle, their shapes of their face had significantly changed. And this is what Dr. Bill Hank is talking about. But my point is nasal breathing was key. These people had large nostrils to be able to handle a large volume of air even during intense physical exercise. If you breathe through your mouth, your breathing is faster. And if your breathing is faster, your mind will be more agitated, and that also will feed back into sleep. Insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea often go hand in hand. One is feeding into the other. The person is coming into you, they're feeling sleepy. Are they feeling sleepy because of the stress response due to breathing pattern disorders? Or are they feeling sleepy due to their sleep disorder? Normal breathing is also what I want to look at because how you breathe is going to influence the pressure created in the airway during sleep. The upper airway is entirely collapsible. The best way to think about it is a collapsible paper straw. If you breathe hard through a straw, there's going to be a pressure exerted on the inner walls of the straw to cause collapse. If you breathe lightly through that straw, there's, there's less negative pressure created in the throat. If you breathe fast, you create increased pressure. And if you think about the CPAP machine, continuous positive airway pressure to split open the airways, well, what's causing the negative pressure in the airways in the first instance is how you breathe. And obstructive sleep apnea is a battle. It's a battle between the negative pressure created during the inspiration versus the dilated force of your upper airways to be able to stay open. If the negative pressure created during breathing is hard, you need a lot more work from the upper airway dilator muscles. There's no point in just looking at the upper airway dilator muscles. We also need to look at the negative pressure. There's enhanced concentration of, na of nasal nitric oxide because nitric oxide is continuously released from the paranasal sinuses and the nasal cavity. And if you breathe fast, you bring in a reduced concentration of nitric oxide. Nasal breathing, normal breathing volume, you've got more normal end tidal CO2, but your nose also works better. The starting resistor model states that if there is an obstruction upstream, it's going to cause an increased negative pressure downstream. Allergic rhinitis. 60 million Americans have allergic rhinitis. They have hay fever. 60 million people. Those people are 1.8 times more likely to have sleep problems. If you have a patient coming into you, and if they've got a stuffy nose, or if they've got asthma, they don't just have a stuffy nose. They don't just have asthma, they are tired. They're more like, likely to be anxious as well, because of course, if you're sleepy, you're not going to be calm. Many of you have children. What's your child like 
if you've deprived that kid of sleep. Sleep is vital for calm mind, for concentration, for productivity. It's been known that back breathing children, they have 10 times the risk of learning difficulties in school. 10 times the risk. It's because of the effect of mouth breathing on their sleep. It's easier to maintain nasal breathing when you have a more normal breathing volume. My point here is that if you go, if you go around with your mouth open for more than six months, when you switch to nasal breathing, you may feel that you're not getting enough air. So we need then to normalize breathing volume and we can do that with various exercises. <laughs>